Hello, welcome to this video. So in this video I will be giving an overview of the book on quantum field theory for the gifted amateur. Um, it'll be an overview of the first part of it and what I'll be doing in this series is gradually going through core parts of the book. I won't do the whole book um, but I'll go over the core parts of it. I'm using it to explain quantum field theory, but if you like this content or are interested in the ideas, I would really recommend purchasing the book itself, because there are parts I will miss out, um, and there are a lot of things I will very kind of quickly gloss over. So this series will be just an overview of the book, and I'll be starting today with the first part, part one, which is what is a quantum field. So, firstly, what is quantum field theory? Um, we first we have to define what a field is in the first place. So, usually in physics, we define a field to be a region around an object in which a particle would feel a particular type of force. Um, and that's a very good classical definition for what a field is. But field, when it's used in the context of quantum field theory, is much more general. Um, and so when we say field in terms of quantum field theory, we mean a mathematical object that takes a position in space or in space-time and gives back an object which refers to the amplitude of something at that point in space-time. So usually, like if you have an electric field in classical physics, um, what that field does is when you give it a position in space, the field outputs the amplitude of that electric field at that particular point in space. So quantum field is just generalising this. Um, it's firstly saying it's the amplitude of something. It doesn't have to be a field referring to a particular type of force. And secondly, the amplitude can be described by a plethora of things, not just a number or a vector, um, unlike the case for the electric field. Um, and also with quantum field theory, the um, mathematical object gives you the amplitude of something at a point in space-time instead of a point in just three-dimensional space. And that's because in quantum field theory we use special relativity, so we're worried about four-dimensional space-time instead of three-dimensional Euclidean space. And space time is four-dimensional because you can think of it like the normal um, uh, three dimensions uh, described by x, y, and z um, that you might see when you're describing something in three-dimensional space, but we add to that time, so we get a four of four dimensions. And we do this because time and space are quite interrelated, uh, as we'll see in a bit. Um, the next thing is that if we're visualising a field, um, it's sometimes helpful to describe the field using field lines, which, and the field lines, how close they are together tells you the strength of the field, um, and the, like, maximum displacement of the field lines tells you the amplitude of the field. Um, and the direction of the field line show you in what direction the field is acting in. So we can tell a lot about a field from the field lines. And the field lines are allowed to oscillate. I mean, if we look at classical um, electrodynamics, the electric field oscillates. So field lines can oscillate quite like waves. And this gives a glimpse into the future. So with quantum physics, we remove the distinction between matter 
and terms of matter being made up of particles and waves, can we consider wave particle duality, where matter can behave like waves and waves can behave like matter? And since fields, uh, as I've described, can act like waves, they can also like like waves, this indicates that quantum fields and particles could also be interchangeable to an extent. Um, and indeed, we'll see that quantum fields um, are related to particles, and particles can be just thought of as excitations of quantum fields. Um, so there's a very close relationship between quantum fields and matter, and quantum field theory goes into depth on what these quantum fields are, how to get them, and then how they relate to physical matter. So although quantum field theory comes up in particle physics when you're interested in the fundamental properties of particles, it also comes up in solid state physics because again we consider particles to be quantum fields. So quantum field theory is really important when you're looking at any branch of physics involving matter, uh, when you're interested in how matter behaves at a fundamental level. And it's worth now giving a note on the notation we use for quantum fields. So, as I said, the position that we feed into a mathematical object, which is our field, um, the position is the position in four dimensional space time. Um, and we often represent the full four dimensional position as x mu, which is the same as. Uh, the time component of the position, which is the speed of light times time. And then the other components are the position in space along the x-axis, the position in space along the y-axis, and the position in space along the z-axis. And as we said, the field is something that gives an amplitude in terms of the position, so we can think of a field as a function of x mu, um, and we usually use phi, the Greek letter, to represent this function, so we often represent a field as phi of x mu, where x mu is our position in four dimensional space time, which we and we also call x mu, therefore, our four position. And so we mentioned that we're looking at position in four dimensional space time and that's because we're using special relativity where we describe positions as positions in space time. So now it's worth going a little bit into depth on what special relativity says about positions. So for this I will be summarizing it, I will be assuming a familiarity with special relativity but um, there are many kind of uh, websites and stuff that go into more um, more of the background behind these ideas. But as a summary, special relativity says that if we consider a reference frame S and we consider the same event happening in a different reference frame S prime, which is moving at speed V relative to S along the X axis, then the coordinates of the events in space time in S and S prime are related via the Lorentz transformations, which are given below. So everything with a prime above it is the coordinates of the event in the space time according to S prime and everything without a prime above it is the coordinates of the event in space-time according to S. Um, and what, there, there are, well, I said that we've got four-dimensional space-time, so you might wonder what's happening to Y and Z. Well, because S prime and S are not moving relative to each other along the Y or X axis, I mean, along the Y or Z axis, um, y prime is the same as y and z prime is the same as z. 
But what we do see is that t prime is different to t and x prime is different to x. So time of in the event is different for the s prime prime than for the s prime and equally positions are different for the s prime prime compared to the s prime. And it's worth saying, uh, uh, just for the sake of being um, kind of complete in our description, that this constant called gamma, which occurs in our Lorentz transformations, is equal to 1 minus beta squared, or to the power of minus a half, where beta is V over C, where C is the speed of light. Um, which for a vacuum is about 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, so very, very fast, but still a finite value. Um, and it's worth saying that for most speeds we deal with in daily life, V is much, much smaller than C, so beta is, above ze is about zero, and this causes special relativity to reduce to something called Galilean relativity, which is the kind of relativity we have a lot of intuition for, and I'll be talking about that in the next slide. Hello, so now we're going to look at Galilean relativity. Now, Galilean relativity, as I said, we get when we make beta approximately zero, and we end up with these equations. Now, before I said these equations like represent Galilean relativity, and that was somewhat of the truth. Um, it's true that kind of the bottom equation for x prime and x does represent Galilean relativity. Um, however, the top equations is a bit more complicated, um, and so whether that fits into Galilean relativity, the one with t prime and t, I won't really be going into because that is a uh, complicated answer. Um, but anyway, if we look at x prime and x, we can see that this equation is fairly intuitive um, by looking at the horizontal blue line, which represents the x coordinate in the s frame and the purple horizontal line, which represents the s x coordinate in the s prime prime. We can see that because s prime has moved, the x prime coordinate system is shifted relative to the x coordinate system, such that um, if we imagine the start of the blue line as being at point zero for the S prime, we can see that zero is actually much later in the S prime frame, so it makes sense that X prime and X should be different, and the amount that shifted by is given by the distance S prime has moved relative to S, and this distance is just the velocity of S prime relative to S multiplied by the time. And so we can see that the relationship between x prime and x is fairly intuitive. So relativity might sound strange because we're talking about different reference frames, but at least Galilean relativity is fairly intuitive. Now, I hope you have liked this video. Um, if you do like the material, please check out the book. It is worth saying I am summarising things here and going fairly quickly because the book has lots of interesting things and the author has spent a lot of time going into it, so I don't want to spell, spill all the beans, but I hope this has been a useful video and hopefully I me mean, going into a little more depth in things like Galilean relativity is beneficial. Um, but I really hope you've liked this um, and uh, if you have, please check out my next video on this series where I'm going through quantum field theory um, and introduction for the gifted amateur.